So um, I don't like to get into things uh, too much of a, of a, on a global scale, but just because I wanted to share all the factors that could influence where the market's going to be going next year, I wanted to get into, there is a, a threat of a recession. Um, uh, many economists who I think have their feet planted firmly on the ground. Those of you who don't know me, a lot of economists, I think they're kind of floating, you know, kind of in a Zen, you know, position, lotus above the ground. They don't really, they're not really in tune with what's happening on the ground. There are a few economists, Benjamin Tal is one that I like, um, who've got their feet on the ground. And those economists feel that even if we were to enter a recession, and Canada has been flirting with recession for the last six months, from what I remember, um, the GTA real estate market should not be much affected. So you can do your own research. Um, I could probably talk five hours about that. Um, but uh, just to give you guys an idea, that's why I'm not too, too worried. This is, this is my question. So I, I believe that we will have a fairly major recession mm -hmm. in the not too distant future. So are you saying that things will not go up as quickly, but they're not going to go backwards? Is that what you're I think saying? what we'll probably experience is similarly to what we did a couple of years ago. So certain uh, asset classes will skate by, right. um, not, not appreciating strongly, but just skate by. Right. And then others will have a correction, whether it's 5% or 20%, I don't know. Right. Um, what I've always found a little bit humorous is, and, and this is when you're re removed, you're not talking about your own home, but you're looking at the market in general, is I remember, um, I think it was from 2016 to 2017, there was one year where Aurora, on average, the homes there appreciated by 50.1 or 50.2 percent. Does anybody remember that number? It was something crazy. Literally, one year to the next, 50 percent appreciation. And then the next year, it lost 20 percent, and people were screaming in the streets. Um, you know, there is a concept of easy come, easy go. Um, so, so what I prefer to. I still remember 1990. I've heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> From my father. Yeah. Now, there's a, I don't have the chart here, but there is something very interesting. Divian, can I borrow your book? Yeah. I have a copy of it here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see if I can remember where this is. Appreciate it, 25 to 28. I promise this is not a plug for my book. Okay. So <laughs> this is um, a chart that we created using real data from 1966 to 2005, okay? The bars indicate um, percentage of appreciation per year increase, and the, the jagged line is, uh, is the price. So a little bit like the chart I just had a, a couple slides ago. So what's interesting is um, 86, 87, 88, no, 87, 88, 89, 90, you had for, sorry, three years in a row, you had 20 plus percent appreciation. Three years in a row. Um, and that was just absolutely unsustainable. And, and when I say three years in a row, the last year was 19%. So almost four years in a row of 20 plus percent appreciation. That's unsustainable. Um, we haven't had, uh, especially in the last couple of years, a lot of steam's been let out of, market, out of the market. There's more steam building, but this is what I've always kept my eye on. Right. 20 plus percent from three years or more, disaster is coming for sure. So should 75% of home owners. Say again? So should 75% of home owners. So should they what? Thank you. They should be looking at the, be watchful of the rates. Yeah, absolutely. Because some people are living beyond their means and uh, they're relying on home equity. As their, as their I, have I have neighbors who uh, a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, three adults in the house have brand new luxury cars and they don't have the jobs for those cars and I know where the money came from. So, yeah. Um, so, something to keep in mind. Also, <laughs> this all this is driven by the interest rate, right? No. If the interest rate goes up, yes. it's going to affect the It's a little rate. bit more complicated than that. Uh, employment is one of the biggest, biggest, biggest factors. Cash flow. Um, yeah. Employment is a massive, massive uh, indicator of what's coming. Um, so I, I like to look at, at employment numbers. I agree with you that interest rates do drive to a certain extent. Um, but for example, commercial real estate, if we're talking about investments in general, commercial real estate always tags long, usually a couple years behind residential. So they react, it reacts less quickly to interest rate fluctuations. Um, <coughs> I agree with you that if interest rates were to rise quickly, 
that there'd be some problems. Yeah, there, there could be because, and second thing, the interest rate bargains. doesn't depend on Canada. We don't have control. It's all about the U.S. The to some extent, yeah. There, automatically, we have to raise the interest rate. Yeah, but you to a certain pay, extent, you yes. The banks here because if we didn't handle things where you can do banking here, to qualify for mortgage and stuff, we'd be, we would be in a bigger mess. Inter interestingly, you know, there was, uh, I should find this article, I have it somewhere. In 2008, um, Canada was on the uh, global scale it being praised at how stable a banking system it has. Um, when things were going an, a nightmare in the States. So that's actually, I actually talked at that point about the US and Canada having a, a, a divorce. Um, we're still very much, I agree with you, can, US is the locomotive and we're one of the cars that usually gets pulled along with it. Um, but we've sort of grown up a little bit in, in the right in, uh, climate uh, to be able to stand on our own and not completely follow, be dragged along by it. Uh, yes. So if there is a <coughs> if there is a recession, that leads to opportunity, correct? Theoretically, it also depends on on the scope, like how the scope of the recession. So, so if if <clears throat> I don't know if you're going to get there, but if, if there is a recession, then there are certain classes of, of properties that will take a dip or mm -hmm. flatten, and it might be a good time to, to invest because it will revert. I don't I don't go there here so much. Okay. But usually, if there's a, a strong recession, there's opportunity in most asset classes. Yeah. But wouldn't you say, to a certain extent, we're, we're kind of living in a little bit of a false economy in as much as that a lot of buyers are still being driven by by, by emotion as, as opposed to uh, intellect. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we find that we've got a new LRT coming in. There's new Go, Go Transit line going now from Niagara Falls mm -hmm. right down to Golden Horseshoe. So now people are now looking to find Stony Creek and mm -hmm. other areas of St. Catharines where they never did before. So it's the optimism and hope of new transit system, new infrastructure. I might as well buy here because when this gets built, my home will be worth more value. I might as well buy it. But it's, but it's also pragmatic to a certain extent because I have these conversations with real buyers. And so it's pragmatism sometimes where somebody says, look, right now I'm driving an hour, um, but if I buy in this area, I decide to put down roots. I stop renting. I buy wherever I am, Stony Creek, Barry, Newmarket, wherever it is. Instead of driving an hour each way, I'll be taking uh, uh, public transit for half an hour if there's a good hub that's now running well or, or is expected to run well in the next five years. But I agree with you. There are speculators. I'm not a big fan of speculation. A lot of what I'm going to talk about here is not speculation. Um, if, you, if you like to speculate, please go to the casino. And you'll probably <laughs> spend less than what you would on a, on a house or a condo. Yes? You know, on the subject of speculation, you know, I just want to kind of bring two things here. Uh, it, the process of buying a house in a supply constrained market is essentially bidding. To a certain the extent, yeah. The process of bidding is blind. Yes, it is. Yeah. How is it different from speculation? Because I really, do, because what is happening here in this market is people want to buy at any cost. And so this, that is the reason why I think there is a certain proportion of the graph that you showed. That is the reason why prices are going so high. Mm -hmm. If it's an open market like in Australia or you know where everybody knows, you know, there are some twenty people bidding on a property. Yeah, and you know what they're bidding. And, yeah, yep. I just you know put a thousand dollars more. Why I I agree with you, but respectfully, whether I agree with you or, or I don't, it doesn't really matter. The reality is this is happening, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. I believe there's a change coming. There's a new rule now or a new. Uh, Act or something passed, which says that the buyer, no, the seller has the right to disclose whether all the. Uh, yes, are I think that's been proposed. I think it's been proposed. Yeah. I don't think it's in in place yet, uh, but I agree that it's it's been proposed, and I would art. I would postulate that most sellers, with guidance from their listing agents, I'm not saying I agree with them, but most of them are going to not do what you just, right. what they're they're going to be allowed to do. Right. The same thing. Uh, opening up sales data was supposed to revolutionize and put every realtor out of business. Didn't happen. I don't think that that change is going to... It's a step in the right direction, very much so. Maybe one day we'll have open, properly open bidding and that'll be the law. I don't know. Um, but it's interesting. Nobody ever complained about this until about 12, 15 years ago. In a normal market, in a balanced market, I mean, I remember... It was normal for a property to take three months to sell. Now, 
if a realtor hasn't sold in 10 days, they come to me and go, what do I do? It's been on the market for 10 days and nobody's made an offer. Um, it's truly. So uh, before this time, it was normal. And you'd, you'd run your sa same old school brokers. We still do the same work as we used to, which is you run your sales comparables. You say, okay, property A looks a lot like property B. Um, so if it sold in the last month for X dollars and they're very similar finishes, age, construction quality, layout, design, number of bedrooms, finished basement, lot size, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're in close proximity without any neighborhood uh, amenities or, or, or negative influences on either one, then this property is worth pretty much what that property is, or what it just sold for. Um, where I think that there's a big problem is how, and this is a deep hole to go down, but I'll just say it quickly. <coughs> where I think there's a problem is um, realtors are incentivized a certain way. So if I'm, if I'm representing a buyer, um, I have to, I mean, people who work with me find this out eventually and, and buyers, they have to make up their mind if they trust it or not. But I am, I get excited. I get a kick out of saving my clients money. And if they pay $10,000 more to, what is it? $250 in my pocket. I don't care about that. What I care about is knocking it out of the park with them. So they talk to 10 people and say, you wouldn't believe what this guy just did. But it's unusual, and I'm not, I'm not the only one, that's not what I'm saying. But the problem is the vast majority of realtors, they're not incentivized. If, and especially if their client tells them, well, I could pay up to 700, but I'd really rather keep it to 650. Unfortunately, most of these realtors, now in their head, they've got, eh, they can pay up to 700. So they're not gonna fight very hard. Whereas I like to think I, some of us uh, do things a little differently, where if our client says 700, but you know, my life's going to be difficult if I buy for more than 650. I don't want to get a phone call from my client in six months saying, I can't pay my bills because you allowed me to pay 680. Now, they still sign in everything. You know, I, I even t have a deal sometimes with buyer clients. I say, look, tell me what, I know that you can afford more, but for this property, tell me what your maximum is now and send me an email saying, Claude, I want you to hold me to this because it's too emotional and, and the consultants or the service providers are reverse incentivized. There's not an incent, a financial incentive for me to get a low price. So I agree with you. If that you were sort of talking about what's wrong with the market, that part I really don't like. That's not good. But I can't do anything about it other than do what I think is right. So it, it, it is frustrating. For those of you who, who didn't follow right off the bat, um, in Australia they have a system where you, sometimes you'll just st stand on the front lawn of the property that's being sold and it's in its auction style. Wow. So you actually hear and know what somebody is bidding. So somebody says, I'll pay 410. You say, well, I'll pay 425. So there's none, nobody's going to say all of a sudden, I'll pay 600 when somebody just said 425. But I think the point was the current market where it's blind and you know, you put in offers, nobody's allowed to, realtors are not allowed to share or are not supposed to share what other people are, are bidding. Um, you might pay 600. If, if, you know, your, your, your partner at home said, we've, we've missed out on five properties in the last two months. Don't come home tonight if you don't have a house to come with. Uh, I've heard this before. So, and that, and that puts extreme pressure and people do silly things.